start. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to today's uh, um, BSC Applied Medical Sciences TASER session. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Marta Zakaria. I am a current Applied Medical Sciences student here at UCL and I'll be your chair for this afternoon. Uh, we are hoping this TASER session will address those course specific questions that you may have and will also help you to gain some insight into what it's really like to study Applied Medical Sciences. Um, so this afternoon, our speaker will be Professor Jennifer Ron, and uh, she will introduce, introduce you to some of the great uh, science and medicine that you will learn here as a student of Applied Medical Sciences at UCL. Uh, Professor Ron was, will also provide a summary of the BSc Applied Medical Sciences program, and there will also be a Q&A session, so plenty of interactive opportunities for everyone to join uh, throughout today's session. Um, this session is also being recorded, so it will be made available on our website following today's event. And we're here to respond to your questions, so please feel free to share those in the Q&A chat. Uh, there is a function, specific function on Zoom. And so now to our speaker, uh, Jennifer Ron. Professor Ron is a cell biologist at University College London, and she's also an author. She's a key member of the teaching staff of our Applied Medical Sciences BSc program, and she is a principal research fellow within the Division of Medicine at the Royal Free Hospital, uh, where her research team studies the interaction of pathogens with the human host. So over to you, Professor Ron. Thank you. Thanks, Marta, for the nice introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. If Marta, if you could let me know, can you see it? Mm-hmm. And can you see my laser pointer? Yes. yes Brilliant. Well, thanks everybody for coming. It's really nice to see you here today. Uh, this is a, a talk of two parts. The first part, I'm gonna give you a taster lecture about my speciality, which is uh, bacteria. Just to give you a taste of what it's like to, to be lectured by somebody who works on applied medical sciences. And then I'll talk a little bit about the course and the structure before the Q&A. So, the bacteria are coming, <laughs> the antibiotic resistance crisis. I'm here to tell you about a really scary story about something that's unfolding right now that's been unfolding for many years and was actually a real problem before the pandemic and still is a problem after the pandemic. It's a serious problem and I, I'm hoping to encourage you to think more about how you might personally be able to help in this battle against our ancient enemies. And when I say ancient, I mean really ancient. So this is a timeline of life on Earth, uh, well, well actually the entire planet, 4.5 billion years old our planet is. And this timeline goes from 4.5 billion all the way to the present day, which is here. And you can see that bacteria arose on this planet 3.5 billion years ago. So almost as soon as the Earth had cooled enough to support life, the bacteria were all over it. So there they are. They, they're here they are, they're on the planet. They're, they're here long before anything else. They're here well before the first eukaryotes, which were just single-celled organisms, on one and a half or two billion years ago. The first mammals didn't arrive until 200 million years ago, which is nothing. And us, which is the tiny pixel on the end of this line, 200,000 years ago, humans came onto the scene. So you can see the bacteria were here long before us and really had the run of the place. And we're just very late latecomers and just out of interest. We know about these dates because bacteria can leave impressions in the fossil record. This is a, a bay in Australia and you can see these really cool stromatolites, which are rocks made out of present day bacteria that are, are depositing uh, sand and sediment in these communities. And these guys can last for, for millennia and you can slice them open and look for evidence. And that's how we know the bacteria are really old. So there were a lot of bacteria on our planet, five million trillion trillion and that is more than the number of stars in the universe in case you're interested and the scary thing is that on our bodies and within our bodies there's a hundred trillion bacteria crawling all over our hair our skin up our nose and our guts and that makes us 10 times more bacterial than human which really makes you think so there's a lot of them out there even though they're very very small it's a huge massive burden right so Ever since we've been able to keep records, we know that bacteria have been causing our species a lot of problems. This is just one example, the Black Death, which killed probably a, a third of Europe uh, back in the day, so it's about 1300s or so. So we can see this captured in histories of the time and, and artwork from the time. This is from a Bible from 1411. This could be 
the Black Death, we're not really sure, but it looks a little bit like um, bubonic plague. And bubonic plague is, is simply caused by a very, very small bacteria. It's only one or two microns in width, there they are. They live in the hindgut of the, the fleas, and the fleas live on the rats, and the rats live around people. And that's why um, Yersinia pestis was so, it was able to kill lots of people because of the rats. Um, back, back then there were lots of, um, it was very sanitary, and there were lots of rodents around. So yeah, <laughs> there's lots of bacteria. They're all over us, they're everywhere, and they've been causing problems for as long as we've been around. You might say to yourself, well, Professor Rohn, I learned in my you know, GCSEs that we've got a really advanced immune system. And it's true, we do. We've got B cells, we've got T cells, we've got beautiful things like this, which is the antibody. Antibodies, of course, are these proteins that patrol around and look for foreign invaders, such as viruses and bacteria. These are the things that are stimulated by things like the COVID vaccine. These are awesome, right? These are really amazing defenses, but we still get sick. Why is that? Why are we not, you know, we're very highly evolved. Why can't we fight these tiny little creatures? And the answer is because the bacteria being so old and ancient and wily have all sorts of tricks up their sleeve to get around our defenses. And I'm gonna give you just two examples. Um, the first example is from my own line of research. This is E. coli, which you've all heard of. It's the bacteria that lives in your poo and gives it that delightful smell. So there's lots of E. coli in your gut right now, and it's doing great things for you. It's helping you digest your food. It's even adjusting your health. We know a lot, a lot about the microbiota, as it's called. This is the, the component of bacteria in our gut. They do amazing things for us. But usually in the gut, they just hang out on the surface and they don't get up to much mischief. But if they get into the wrong place, for example, if they end up in the urinary tract, things can go horribly wrong. So E. coli, of course, the, the, they're in your guts, which is, you know, your back passage where you poo, and it can sometimes get into your urethra, which is where you urinate. It can crawl up into the bladder. I hope you're all sitting comfortably. <laughs> Just imagining all these bacteria in your bladder. And there's an amazing experiment that was done with mice a few years back. You can see this is a, a camera they put inside a mouse bladder, and this is the mouse bladder, you know, in a healthy mouse. But if you inject E. coli into the urinary tract of mice, you end up with this terrifying structure, which is known as a pod. And this, is, this thing is a, a big sack that's full of bacteria that have basically, they dived into your bladder and they started replicating inside your bladder. They made this huge blister. And you can imagine what happens when the blister breaks. It's a little bit like alien. It's really horrifying. This is a video of a green labeled bacteria in a pod that has burst. And you can see all the bacteria fly out. So while they're in the pod, they're safe and happy and protected. And when they fly out, they can reinitiate infection. And this is why some people get UTI over and over again. So you might say, well, we have defenses against bacteria in the bladder. Yes, we have patrolling white blood cells. And here's an example of one. It's not, it's actually purple, but it's not really purple. It's just colored purple. This is a white blood cell gobbling up some bacteria. So yes, they are patrolling, but E. coli has a way around these guys. So there's, there's got, it's got two ways of getting around these defenses. First of all, normally E. coli looks like a tic-tac, a little, a little capsule shape, but they can make these long spaghetti-like shaped forms. And these spaghetti-like shaped forms have an amazing property. And I'll show you this, this is a really cool video. So essentially what you're looking at here, this, this long green guy is an E. coli that looks like a spaghetti. So it's one of these special forms. The gray guys are the tic-tacs, the normal shaped ones. And these blue guys are the white blood cells that want to gobble them up. They're trying to hoover them up, right? So here we go. So have a look at this video. It's not playing. It's not playing. Okay, that's disappointing. If I can make it play. Oh, here we go. Okay. Nom, 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 nom. So it's nomming up all the gray things, but it cannot seem to eat the spaghetti shape. It's, it's either can't see the spaghetti shapes because it's like an invisibility cloak, or they don't like the taste. <laughs> but either way, these bacteria will not get eaten and they can go on to infect us and, and make us sick again. Okay, here's another example. This is one of my favorite bacteria. It's called Listeria monocytogenes. This guy lives inside cells all the time. It has no um, extracellular life cycle. It only lives inside cells and it can move around. Isn't that awesome? Look at them rocketing around. But, but how do they get from cell to cell? What they do is, they're, see this guy there? He's trying desperately to get to the next cell by pushing through and never, never going outside, but just making a little bridge. It doesn't quite capture on this video, but these bacteria can spread from cell to cell without ever exposing themselves to the immune system. So this is another very clear, clever mechanism by which bacteria can escape the immune system and cause disease. Okay, so before we had drugs for bacteria, things were really dire. Like if you tried to have surgery and you opened up somebody 
um, the chances of getting an infection were very high and many people died during uh, routine surgeries. They also died of things like cuts. Uh, you know, you scratch yourself on a thorn and you could die from that. So one in three of all deaths uh, before antibiotics were caused by, were associated with bacteria. So bacteria were really, they really had the upper hand until that momentous uh, moment when Alexander Fleming made this miraculous and very accidental discovery of penicillin. You probably all know the story. It's a lovely story. He had a Petri dish full of bacteria. That Those are the white things. This is actually a photograph of the original Petri dish. Uh, photography wasn't very good back then in 1925. This is a big splodge of mold that accidentally landed on his Petri dish. And you can see this big black swathe is a place where the bacteria were killed. So Fleming thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> something's happened here. The, the mold is, is making something that's killing this bacteria. What is that stuff? <laughs> and that stuff turned out to be penicillin G, which is a natural ancient byproduct of microbes. So the, the, the mold does not make penicillin so that humans can use it. The mold uses it for its own purposes and that purpose is competition. Bacteria and fungi and all the other small organisms fighting all the time for resources and they secrete or they spew out all these antibiotics to, to fight each other. So they're weapons. So they're not making it for us, they're making it for themselves. But we found out that we could use those as drugs. And that was really an, an amazing discovery. And how does penicillin work? It's quite cool. So bacteria need to have a very, very tight cell wall because they're in the environment and they could explode if there's too much water. They have to keep that cell wall completely tight. And to do that, they use an enzyme called DD transpeptidase. I just call it DD for short. This is acting like mortar in the bricks. It keeps the cell wall together. Penicillin flies in, messes up the DD, so it can no longer mortar those bricks together and the bacteria explodes and dies. So that's how penicillin works. It's really great because uh, penicillin does not affect our cells at all. We've got nothing, we've got no target there. So it's like a magic bullet, it only kills bacteria. And after Fleming's discovery, there was a golden age of antibiotic discovery in the 20th century. Like Selman Waxman, he was an amazing guy. He single-handedly discovered all these antibiotics, he and his, his team, um, actinomycin, streptomycin, all these really important antibiotics. Lots of people discovered lots of antibiotics. And people thought, whoa, we've got dozens and dozens of antibiotics. We can stop looking for them now. So we stopped. We basically got about 20 and we stopped. And all of these um, antibiotics work a little bit differently. Um, just want to highlight that they either affect the cell wall synthesis like penicillin or they affect some sort of unique process in common to bacteria like their, the way they replicate their DNA or their RNA or make protein. These are all processes that are different, different enough from humans so that when you take an antibiotic, it only affects the metabolism of the bug. So that's, that, they're all like magic bullets, they're amazing. So it, it was not perfect, right? Even back in Fleming's day, he noticed in his laboratory that some of the bacteria suddenly became resistant to penicillin when they used to be sensitive, and that really worried him. It worried him so much that on, in his Nobel lecture speech, when he was accepting his prize for being so smart and discovering penicillin, he, he said he, he spent a lot of time saying, I'm really worried about my discovery because I think the bacteria are going to develop resistance. And I'm really worried that people are taking bacteria Sorry, they're taking antibiotics when they have a cold, you know, or they're, they're not taking the full course of their antibiotics, they're misusing antibiotics, and I'm worried they're encouraging the bacteria to become resistant. He sounded like a time traveler from the 21st century. He was really smart, and he was really worried, and he should have been, because that very same year, out in the front of World War II, started to trickle back from, you know, this news that soldiers were getting sexually transmitted diseases that were resistant to penicillin. And there are a lot of posters like these came up. They always blame the women for these things, which is so unfair. But anyway, um, it, it was common knowledge that the bacteria, although we had this amazing drug, it wasn't working anymore. And that was really disturbing. So how, how does a bacteria get around this? So that the answer is that the bacteria have their own weapons. And one weapon is called beta-lactamase. This is a bacterial gene that's kind of like a scissors that cuts penicillin and breaks it apart and it doesn't work anymore. So it doesn't matter how much penicillin you throw in a bacteria, if it's got these scissors, it just says, meh, you're not gonna hurt me. So beta-lactamase is a gene and it can be passed from bacteria to bacteria like a business card. And bacteria, once they have a useful gene like this, they pass it all over the place. Like you might shake hands with someone and the bacteria will jump on that other person's hand. And then that, that person might get on a plane and fly to Singapore and then shake a bunch of other hands. Before you know it, these antibiotic resistant genes have spread all over the world. It's really scary and really easy to do. 
So how does it work? Well, here's your red bacteria. This is the bacteria that's resistant to penicillin and all his white friends here are sensitive. If you put penicillin everywhere, all of the white ones will die and, and the red ones will take over. And it's the same whether it's in a petri dish or whether it's in a country. Once you have resistant bacteria and you're flooding everybody with, with antibiotics, this is what happens. Okay, and if you don't have antibiotics, this is just a fun little video we shot in my lab. These are bladder cells covered with E. coli, time lapse overnight, and you can see the bacteria are dividing and dividing every 20 minutes. They divide like the clapper. And then before you know it, we came in the next morning, you couldn't even see the cells. So if you have no drugs to oppose an, a bacterial infection, you're basically doomed. <laughs> so antibiotics are super important. I hope I've managed to convince you of that. But the scary thing is that resistance is accelerating. So back in the day, you know, okay, penicillin was quite resistant early on. But look, all of these drugs, tetracycline, it lasted 10 years before resistance was reported in the community. Um, erythromycin lasted almost 20 years, as did vancomycin. And, but by and large, when we, we released a new antibody, discovered a new one, it would last at least a couple of decades. But then something weird happened in 1990. It, things stopped becoming if things stop having any use at all, they were immediately resistant. It's almost like the bacteria were learning how to resist us. And the reason why is quite clear. And that is because we've been overusing antibiotics and that's been accelerating too. So pe more and more people are taking antibiotics when they shouldn't. They can go on websites like this and get free, you know, cheap antibiotics, even though they don't have a prescription. There are countries where you don't need a prescription to have an antibiotic. People pop them like pills when they have a slight sniffle. It's really awful. And also we dose all our agriculture with antibiotics uh, to try to prevent them from getting diseases. The result is the entire planet is drenched in antibiotics, just like that petri dish with the red things. We're drenching our planet with the drugs and those that are resistant are thriving and passing it on and those that are sensitive are dying off. So the net result is lots and lots of antimicrobial resistance. And this is a perfect storm situation because while we had this golden age of antibiotics, we had 20 antibiotic classes discovered between 25 and 87, 20 classes. And that's when we all stopped and said, ah, oh, we've got plenty, we don't need any more. Resistance to all of them is on the rise. Some of them are completely useless. And no new antibiotic class has been discovered since 1980s. That's a long time ago. Meanwhile, the bacteria are getting more and more resistant. You can see it's on this chart, the number of antibiotics approved. It's just nosedived. Nobody's working on it. And, and even if we started right now, which, we're, which we are, of course, it can take 20 years to go from an idea to a marketed drug. So we're already 20 years behind getting new antibiotics. But the future is now. It's not like some distant future when we're going to be in trouble. This really scary paper that came out recently showed, estimated that there are about 5 million deaths a year associated with AMR, or antimicrobial resistance, meaning these patients died. There was no other drug. They tried every single drug and none of them worked. That's now 5 million people dying a year. And this is projected to rise because resistance is rising. So that's scary too. <laughs> Right, and the, the thing that really winds me up a little bit is that we've known about this problem since Alexander Fleming in the 1945 lecture where he warned us all this was going to happen. And there's been loads and loads of newspaper articles about it all throughout history, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, everyone's saying, oh, we have to be careful, antimicrobial resistance, blah, blah, blah. Nobody ever listened. So here we are in this current situation. We've known about it. We've been sleepwalking into this, this almost this apocalypse. <laughs> And it's time that really we need to do something about it. Why? But why have we let ourselves, we're smart, right? We're humans. Why have we let ourselves get into this situation? We used to have the upper hand in bacteria and now they fought back. Why? Well, there's some very interesting reasons. They're, they're socioeconomical and scientific. So antibiotics are very cheap. You can get them for pennies. So a, a, a drug company won't make a lot of profit making them. So it's hard to convince the shareholders to devote money to something that will make a profit. Similarly, you know, if, you have, if you're on beta blockers or a statin, you take it every day. But if you have an infection, you might take it only once every three years. So again, it's not gonna sell a lot of pills. And then if you do decide to devote yourself to antibiotics, it's really hard. It's really hard to make a decent antibiotic. In fact, usually it's like minus 50 million dollars if you try to make one, because it usually doesn't work. Whereas if you make a successful musculoskeletal drug, you could make a $1 billion profit. So obviously there's no financial incentive for, and they're not evil. It's not that the, the pharma is evil and just wants to make money. It cannot do its research without money. So you, you cannot work in something that won't pay or you'll just go under. So it's not, it's not, it's not an evil thing. It's a practicality thing. 
There were also a lot of regulatory hurdles to, to trialing new drugs. And actually, I think since COVID-19, some of those may ease up a bit. It might be easier to approve new drugs because we did it really quickly during the pandemic. So that's one good thing. And finally, I mean, scientifically, we have found all the easy ones. Selman Waxman, and he discovered 15 antibiotics in 20 years, he found them all. So if you go out now to the soil and you try to find a new antibiotic, you're going to discover penicillin <laughs> because most things don't grow in, that are in the soil don't grow in the lab. It's really hard to find new antibiotics. So what we do is, is need interesting new solutions. And here's one example. I love this example. This is a um, you know, since, since the bugs that grow in soil don't grow in the lab, these guys decided to take their lab to the soil. So they, they took a petri dish and they buried it in the back garden to see what would grow in the natural environment and immediately discovered a new, an interesting new antibiotic called Texobactin. We don't know if this is gonna make it or not, but it's a really promising start. And all this was from thinking outside of the box, like how can we find new antibiotics? A lot of people are now looking in extreme environments. Let's go sample bacteria from the deep oceans. Let's go sample bacteria from deserts, from the Arctic, um, places where we haven't already tried. Maybe we'll find new antibiotics that way. And finally, we're trying to do non-antibiotic alternatives. We're trying to be smart with different kinds of compounds and processes to try to find interesting new ways to kill bacteria that don't involve antibiotics and that might not be so prone to resistance. So the, the nutshell of my taster talk is, we really need less talk about AMR. We understand why it happens. We know it's happening. We've known about it for a century almost. What we need is more action. And what we need are really smart people to save the planet. I'm not even exaggerating here. I really think AMR is such a huge problem. And I think we need young, young people with bright new ideas. We need the, the, the next generation of scientists to come and think about these interesting problems. And it, uh, if, you apply, if you go to apply medical sciences, we have a lot of infection stuff. And if you're interested in this topic, please do get involved because we need you. So that was my taster talk, um, which has a little bit of a flavor of what the kind of things you might learn on the course. Um, just a very quick, I know you want to ask questions, just a very quick overview of the course. Um, it's a three-year BSc. It's run out of the Division of Medicine and it's uh, program director, sort of David Sprott, Kevin Moore. Um, the Division of Medicine has had to big it up a little bit because it's really amazing. It's, it's one of the largest, it is the largest department in the Faculty of Medical Sciences. We have a really cool mix of clinicians and, and uh, basic scientists working together. It's almost a 50-50 mix. So there's lots of doctors, lots of patients, lots of basic scientists all working together to try to cure diseases. Uh, we've got close contacts with lots of world-leading London hospitals. And we really excel at research, teaching, and clinical practice. So it's the, it's the whole package here at UCL. The most recent government audit, the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, uh, just happened. And UCL came first in the UK for research power in medicine and health and life sciences. So really, you could say that we are the best in the UK. Of course, there's many different ways to measure quality, but this is just one of them. And we're really proud of this result. OK, and, and, and you know, prizes aren't everything. But also, I'm really proud of, you, of UCL's Nobel Prize record. 94, sorry, 29, <laughs> 29 Nobel Prizes. Uh, 27 of those based in the sciences, and 16 of those 27 were in physiology or medicine, which is the topic of this course. So really, you'd be studying in a place that has, you know, has an amazing track record for amazing discoveries. So yeah, um, the ethos of the course is that we develop science graduates with a strong background in both medical sciences and basic sciences. And if you look at our logo, it's the rod of Asclepius. You probably know this, it's the symbol of a, being a doctor. It's supposed to be two snakes, but we, we replaced one of the snakes with a DNA helix to, to symbolize the fusion that we have. And we really wanna develop graduates who are fluent in both worlds. And you can take a personalized and tailored degree, choosing from a wide range of modules and really you can go after your dream job. There's lots of lots of different things you can do with this degree. Um, and just the, cor the course structure is quite nice. Um, it, the thing that I like about this is that in our faculty, we have six sister courses. They're shown up here. Here's us, and then there's the others, a bit more specialized. But in year one, it's called the Integrated Medical Sciences Year. You share all your almost all your, your classes and modules with students in the other courses. So you're all together uh, as one big cohort taking the core modules, which is basically a whistle-stop tour of the human body uh, and the science underpinning physiology. There's a few optional modules. And then from there, from year two onwards, you, you specialize. Now I say specialize, but in AMS, you never really, we don't force you to specialize in one thing. You specialize in your own interests. The other courses are a bit more focused, 
Now, the nice flexible thing about this structure is that at the end of year one, if you decide you're actually really interested in cancer or immunology or any of these other things, you can switch courses really easily. We just, we just swap you over, there's no fuss. So equally, you know, people from other, from other courses might come into our course. So we have a little bit of a exchange at the end. So it's really flexible. You're not exactly sure what you wanna do. Um, you're not trapped in there for the three years. But after, the, after year one, you then do need to commit to that course. Um, I think AMS is an amazing place to work out what area of biology and medicine you really like. So a lot of our applicants are people who didn't get into medical school and we welcome them <laughs> and they come into our course and sometimes they decide they like science better. And sometimes they leave AMS and go on to medicine either at the graduate or um, undergraduate level. We have a great track record of getting our students into medical school. It's one of the top destinations. Um, equally, we sometimes have people who think they want to be scientists, they come into AMS and they realize, God, I want to be a doctor, <laughs> and they go on and do medicine after AMS. So it's a wonderful place to really, if you're not sure what you want to do, I would highly recommend this course because it will help you focus and give you lots of options. Um, I'm not going to go over the slide too much, it's just to say that we have a very wide range of teaching methods because we know people learn differently. We've got the live lectures, we've got flip lectures, we've got small group teaching, workshops, labs, you name it. There's all sorts of different ways that we teach. Um, there's lots of face-to-face -face teaching, 15 hours a week roughly, and um, you're taught by a mix of professional teachers, um, leading scientists, and leading clinicians. So it's you really can learn about things from people people who are highly trained to teach but also people who do this stuff for a living and that is very exciting um what are the graduates doing so we keep track of our graduates those that we know about we keep a database um, this database is slightly out of date but it hasn't changed much um just to give you some examples um you can a lot of our students go straight into employment uh clinical trials management consultancies they go into public health they work for the government we had somebody working for number 10 <laughs> in the press office, which is quite exciting, teaching, financial, it, working in the city, basically probably earning twice as much as I do, um, science communicating, communication and writing. Uh, but most of our graduates go on to further study. You can see this pie graph here, master's uh, degrees is the most popular destination, medicine and PhD neck and neck. <laughs> so th these numbers hardly ever change, like most, most go on to master's and then the next most popular destination is PhD in medicine. Some of our PhDs have already got their PhD and they're going on to postdocs. It's so exciting. It's wonderful to watch our students thrive and blossom. And yeah, I, I think it's just an amazing course with a lot of great prospects. So, I mean, it'd be really great if you wanted to join us. It's fun, it's stimulating, nice people, smart people. And uh, I think that's probably enough for me. So. At this point, I'd like to open it up for the Q&A, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and put you back with our wonderful chair, Marta. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the excellent session, Fisron. That was great. I learned a few things, too. No, um, you should have learned that already. <laughs> Just it kidding. was a recap. It was a recap. Yes. I did remember some of the great videos. Um, I really find this quite fascinating, I must say. You're back to your so, um Okay. Ooh, any, any, any questions in the chat? Mm, at the moment, I... Oh, yes. Okay. So, um, what was it like to live in London? What's it like to live in London? I think that's a, a question for you, Marta. Um, yes, I can <laughs> say that. I can try to answer that. I actually moved to London to... Um, study at UCL Applied Medical Sciences from Italy and uh, moving from a small town to, to London is, is great. London has so many opportunities in terms of, well, uh, you're really surrounded by um, a great research environment at UCL. There are other opportunities around you as well. And it's just a great city to, let's say, uh, have a great student life as well as, uh, you know, study and be surrounded by academics and researchers who do really interesting science and medicine, I must say. Yeah. Yeah, I moved here from America. I love London. I moved here just to do one, you know, uh, research stint and I never left <laughs> 25 years later. I think London's amazing. It's just mm -hmm. the most amazing place. I really enjoy just walking around and exploring. There's always something new. It's so big. 
Um, okay, a few more questions coming in. Uh, what GCSC grades do you need for UCL? GCSE grades. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, my... Okay, for GCSEs, I've got here English. So for for the, the UK, English language and maths, a grade B or six. That's the GCSEs. Um, and then if you're international, there's other requirements, but it's all on the website. Perfect. Thank in you. Fact, I might pop that in the chat, the link to the requirements. Mm -hmm. That's one. Okay, so the link I just put in is the link that fully describes all of the requirements. And if you're from a foreign country, you can um, click on your country and it will tell you. Mm -hmm. I have another question for you, Professor Ron. Uh, yeah. How many places do you have for the AMS course every year? Well, at the moment, um, it's about 70, but we, re we reassess that number every year. So it might go up. I can't say one way or the other, but at the moment we've been having about 70 places. Um, although with the, you know, with the pandemic, we had more, a lot more offers than, than usual and we let in more people than we normally do. So we've actually got more than 70 this year, but uh, as an idealized number, it's, it's been 70, but, but we have taken more in the past. And this, this is subject to change without notice. Okay. And now I see a question perhaps for um, either of us. Uh, what do you recommend doing to help with your application to UCL? Do you have any suggestions for us, Ron? Should I? Well, sure. I mean, first of all, you need to get the A levels. Mm -hmm. So in case anybody wants to know, it's, you need two A's and a B. You have to have an A. One of the A's has to, has to be biology, plus one A has to be from chemistry, maths, or physics. Uh, so that's the requirement, and IB is... 36. <laughs> so first you need to get the you need to get the marks. There's no way around that. You have to get the, the entry requirements or we won't we can't let you in, unfortunately. Um, and then all that's left is a personal statement, which is an important document that you really need to put some thought into. I always tell people um, it's very obvious when people have gotten help with their with you know, like there are some companies that will sell you personal statements and those are really obvious. So we look for genuine, like really enthusiastic, real letters. Um, the personal statements. We, we want to see what your interests are. We want to understand why you want to take the course. We're really looking for a certain kind of person who's critical and smart and curious and creative. And yet just be yourself and, and, and tell us what you're up to. And I mean, that's really, um, it, there's no trick to it. We're not, we're not marking your English or anything. So if you if, you're, if English is not your native language, it doesn't matter. We're not scoring you on your spelling. But, you know, just put some personality into it and put your passion into it. That's what I would say. I don't know if you have any advice, Marta. I completely agree, really. Just showing interest is, is the key. Um, yeah. Um, a bit more, uh, perhaps, for you, Professor Ron. What is the relationship between applied medical sciences and medicine? Uh, there's no relationship. So, um, for example, if you, you can't sort of go, you can't go into UCL Medical School, like sort of as a conveyor belt from applied medical sciences. The link is that we have a lot of teachers in common. So a lot of the people who teach on the medicine course also teach for us. Um, we, we learn a lot of medicine in the course, but it's not a medical degree. Actually, I think year one is kind of like medical school compressed into one year. You, you learn sort of all the parts of the body, but not in so much detail. You don't need to memorize all the bones and, and things like that, but you learn sort of the basics. But it is, it is about the science behind the medicine so it's not quite the same yes and another question again between let's say differences uh, between courses now it's about biomedical science and applied medical science <laughs> I, must say, I had that question myself when i was we get it all what the to time. Do with you guys mm -hmm. yeah, we get it all the time so biomedical science is an amazing course they're awesome right they're great and it's a, it's a really good course but they focus a little bit more on basic science and not so much on medical science. So you will learn all about cells and genetics and, and things, but, but, but not necessarily from a, a biomedical focus. If you're interested in health and, and health research and, and diseases, I think you're probably better off with, I mean, I won't say one way or the other. I mean, they're both really good courses. It just depends on your interest. But yeah, the, the main difference is that we have a more medical focus. Mm -hmm. Going back to the requirements, um... There is a, a question about international GCSEs 
and if whether these are equivalent to GCSEs, and if so, let's say, um, yeah, if the grades can be the same as for the GCSE entry requirements. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there are other, so if you go to the link, if you go to the link in the chat and you go to the other qualifications tab, you can actually put your country in there on a drop down menu and it will tell you everything. And if that doesn't answer your question, you can contact admissions. I think that um, Kate is going to put a link to admissions into the chat so that, um, yeah, I mean, admissions questions are always best. You're always best to go to admissions because they, they're the ones who just make the decisions, not us. Mm -hmm. Okay. But do try the website first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and back instead to what we could do to perhaps boost our application, um, there's a question of what type of work experience or volunteering should I get to get into medical school? So this is not medical school, but I don't know if perhaps you would answer that. I have no idea. So that's a totally different course. I mean, yeah. I, I, I have heard that it's important to do, to, to try to get volunteer placements in clinical settings and things, but mm -hmm. that's not what we do. So. You're better yeah. off going to a taster day and open day uh, for MBBS and they can answer all your questions. Mm -hmm. And then what is the acceptance rate for combined medical sciences? I, I'm guessing they're saying integrated medical sciences. I don't know if you have an idea of the acceptance rate. For I don't actually know that answer. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that answer is even public. I, I don't know. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you get an offer, I mean, yeah. I think at the moment it's it's quite competitive, but I think you've got a good chance of getting in. But you know, I can't promise. Um, interest is rising year on year, so yeah. work on that personal statement and make sure you get the marks. Mm -hmm, exactly. I, there's just another question I see here about the common most common A level grades and UCAS tariff that uh, go into AMS. But again, and it also if work experience is required. Um, you don't so, need yeah. work experience for mm -hmm. to AMS, but it does show that you've got, you know, in your personal statement, if you can show that you've got hobbies and interests and, and research, uh, volunteering, I mean, it doesn't hurt, but it's not the be all and end all. What we really want to know is that you're enthusiastic and you're the right kind of person. It, it's, it's always good to get experience. Um, there was another part of that question. What was it? I um, no, it was, it was back again to the requirements. I think really the, the answer was in the requirements page. Um, yeah, yeah. Also, and you don't need to get higher than you don't need to get higher than the, mm -hmm. the AAB. It's just you just need to meet that. And, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's all on the page. Yeah. yeah. So now moving on to let's say future. So instead of apl uh, applying once you're in and once you actually get out, what are the job opportunities does apply medical sciences have? Okay, I think I answered that in the talk. But mm -hmm. just to recap, um, pretty much the sky's the limit. We've got all sorts of. Uh, amazing varied careers that our graduates are doing. Like I said, a lot of them go on to further study, so many master's degrees and, and then PhDs straight out of AMS or after the master's. So PhD is really popular. People do want to become scientists who join our, our course, but there's lots of people who don't. So we have people who go on to be doctors, loads of them, and people who go on to do all sorts of amazing things that I'm so proud of, just um, and, and, and go off to other countries and do great jobs. Um, yeah, it's it's really it sets you up to be um, anything you want to be, and I think a degree from UCL is very valuable. And if you have scientific training and you know it's critical thinking skills that employees are looking for, that's why some of our graduates go on to work in the city. And it's not even science related, but the city likes um, science graduates because they have those critical thinking skills. So mm -hmm. we do our best. We have a lot of careers advice, and the UCL careers is an amazing resource so many resources to help you work out what you want to do and yeah, maybe what are you going to do have you decided yet marta um right now i'm looking into phd applications oh, so yeah we'll, we'll see how that goes um yeah hopefully <laughs> but i must say ucl careers is excellent advice i've always gone to them for applying for let's say internships throughout summer and they're great Okay, and back to our questions. Um, by when will we, uh, when you get back to applicants on if they got an offer or not? Uh, yeah, we don't deal with this at all. This is an admissions thing. Mm -hmm. I know that you apply in January. And I don't know how long it takes. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know what the cycle is. Mm -hmm. Okay. More questions coming in? Let's see.
Um, how do you meet, make friends? Uh, perhaps I can answer this question. Um, so UCL has really a great students union. It's got plenty of uh, clubs and societies and you can join as many as you wish. Um, and there is, I think, uh, time to balance, you know, both student life and joining these clubs and societies as well as studying applied medical sciences. Um, and joining those uh, is a great opportunity to make um, friends with people who have your same interests in terms of, you know, sports or any cultural interest or, uh, I don't know, of country where you're from. There, There's so many and you can look it up on the UCL uh, Students Union page on, on the internet. Um, but also, I just say within the course, I mean, my, I have my best friends are actually from applied medical sciences, and there are so many chances, even with uh, tutorials and small group teaching that the course offers to actually get to know people a bit more instead of uh, it's a bit perhaps a bit more difficult just to always chat with people that you just sit next to in the lecture hall. We also have tutorials which really help um, getting to know people a bit better. Um, so I really, I think it's, um, it's really there are many occasions to meet and make new friends. Let's see if anything else is coming up. Please feel free to post any other questions. Okay. Oh, I, I see this one. Um, I can answer this question. The question is if the personal statement is written in medicine for medicine, will it be okay? And the answer is yes. So we take a lot of students who didn't get into medical school. So you can you can put UCL as your safe, uh, you can put our course as your safety course. We will accept the personal statement. Um, it's, it's absolutely fine. So if you wanna to go to medical school, really tailor, tailor your personal statement to medical school. But if you don't get in, we'll take a look at your statement and we won't hold that against you at all. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, what is your favorite thing about studying biomedical sciences? Um, I think I can answer this one. Yes. Um, and for me, it's um, well, it's definitely been uh, many things. I, I just like how the course was structured. In first year, having a lot of basics and physiology and uh, and pathology, just as you were saying, a mix of uh, kind of medicine compressed in a year uh, and then I've actually gone and to further specialize into um, some cancer research and I've had the opportunity to take some optional modules which are offered in the UCL Cancer Institute um, so that has been I think a great opportunity for me to kind of choose a bit which which direction I want to take and not only let's say limit myself to um, cancer institute that they offered modules but also um, op mod optional modules within the division of medicine um, itself and um, yeah, I think that's that's really made a um, made the experience I would say at AMS unique in terms of deciding what I would like, what I'm most interested of in in terms of modules. And let's see if anything else, please feel free to shoot any question. Um, just another one about the application. What are your top tips when applying for applied medical sciences at UCL? Um, I would say showing interest in your personal statement. Um, it perhaps, of course, if you have some previous volunteering experience that kind of backs it up, great. But the important thing is really showing the enthusiasm and as Professor Ong was saying, being really genuine in your personal statement. That is really appreciated. And people who read personal statements have great experience in understanding what is genuine and what is not. So um, yeah, <laughs> so uh, just be yourself in your personal statement. Okay, a couple more I see here. Um, what are the most important qualities of someone who will enjoy studying applied medical sciences? Mm, that's a nice question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, curiosity. Curiosity, creativity, um, yeah, enthusiasm. 
um, well, you have to be hardworking, right? And you have to be focused. Obviously. Um, what else? I have to say, Marta here has is, is embodies all the qualities of a great <laughs> student. You know, I think for me, engagement is the number one thing. You know, if you're sitting there giving a lecture, and you look out in the sea of faces, and the, the people are on the you know on their phone or asleep, there's always a few students who are just like you know with you and listening and engaged. Mm -hmm. and that's what we really like. Those students always do well, mm -hmm. go on to do great things. So, yeah, engagement is really important um, as well. So. I agree. It's it's really nice to be then when once engaging, let's say, uh, how really have a um, you know be able to talk with professors and then at the end of the lecture have these contacts. It's, it's amazing. Um, can you go more in depth what you will go on to learn uh, in applied medical sciences? Okay, and perhaps it's for the variety of the modules. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe give some examples of some of the modules you've taken. Yes, um, so I've uh, taken quite a few of diverse modules to get into different areas, let's say, or step into and have an idea. Um, one was uh, cancer biomedicine, so just basics about cancer. Another one was immunology, so stepping into that in the immunology area. Um, and then in third year, I've done nanotechnology and um, nanotechnology stem cells as well, many new areas, let's say, of uh, research area, as well as, let's say, um, cancer clinical trials. So getting a bit of an idea from that. There, it's so diverse. The opportunities are really great. There are also many nutrition-focused modules. And now I'm um, I'm a fourth-year student. And I'm actually um, taking first nutrition modules. So um, yeah, there's quite a diverse range, I would say. Again, a question about the personal statement. Is there anything in particular that you're looking for? It's just passion for science, that for sure. I don't know if you have anything else to add, but we've already spoken about this perhaps. Okay, what is a typical week of a student studying AMS? Um, I guess again for me. Yeah. So uh, this, this varies, I would say this varies between uh, years. Uh, also because the type of teaching at uh, in the course varies between years and there as Professor Rohn mentioned in, um, in one of the slides about the course the program there are different teaching techniques that are used and so in first year um, there's a lot of flipped learning and a lot of uh, problem-based activities in small tutorial groups happening and so uh, I remember in first year I would be attending uh, lectures at Royal Free Hospital uh, they weren't actually lectures, these were more interactive sessions because the lecture part, the very really didactic part where we were being taught, okay, the different parts of the body and what is uh, going wrong here. There were already some pre-recorded uh, sessions that we were, we were, which were actually also quite interactive, uh, which were given to prepare in advance before the actual um, lecture in person. And in that moment, it was more of a quiz to uh, actually build on the knowledge that we had gained in those recorded lectures that we had online. Um, and there's also a lot of problem-based solving, uh, small teaching in small groups, which really helped to kind of make bonds also in first year. Um, and then in second year and in the later years, I think it's always moved more towards being, um, let's say, lectures more like um, didactic. So really just taking, mainly taking notes, let's say, at lectures and perhaps less of, um, less quizzes during the lectures, less interaction in that sense, but of course, always the possibility to ask questions, etc. And beside the lectures in the throughout the course, there is a coursework. And so once the lecture would be over, there would be uh, you know, kind of homework in some way. Um, and so some assignments to work through throughout the term, and then some studying. But of course, I think there's always been the time, at least for me to also join clubs and societies, as well as, you know, dedicate some time in the morning, well, mornings and afternoons, wherever there were lectures. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that helps. It's <laughs> a good question. Sir. Which of the modules you studied did you find most interesting? And how do people decide where to specialize? <laughs> How do people decide where to specialize? It's 
<laughs> so I mean, now I'm trying to apply for a PhD, and it's like, what do I choose? <laughs> um but uh but you really do realize a bit you know where your interest lies a bit more we have because there's such a range of modules that you can that you you know and let's say topics that you're exposed through uh throughout the course uh you do kind of uh say okay i do do like all science and i love the human body in general but perhaps i like the digestive system and how we eat and how we control our feeding more than how um I don't know, our muscles move or more than how uh, bacteria invade our um, uh, our body, you know. So um, there are, you kind of, I think you, you tell throughout the, um, throughout the course what kind of really touches you most during the lectures. There are so many occasions to kind of get insight from uh, other scientists throughout the course, which is really yeah. helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and for me in particular, which you found most interesting, I think I've I've gone down a bit the cancer research path. So that has been perhaps what I've kind of liked most, but um, it's really hard also for me now to tell actually. Okay. How similar is applied medical science to A-level biology? Well, I mean, you need to get, you need your A-level biology to get in, but then yeah, with after the first module, you're already way beyond that, right? Yeah. I agree. <laughs> it's 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 a university course. It's it's going to have, and also we are not going to cover everything that's an A level biology. I guess not necessarily. Like we're more medically focused. There might be some areas. Oh, we touch on pretty much the basics. But you, when we start specializing, it's more physiology and disease mechanisms. And yeah, there is a module in year two, cell and molecular biology, which is great to actually go back a bit to yeah, biology. Sure. But there, it's. It's so much more than A-level biology already. So, um, yeah. Okay. Any more questions? We still have a few more minutes to go. Don't see anything popping in the chat right now, but please feel free to continue doing so. I think maybe we should draw to a close. I mean, it's practically an hour and yeah. lots of questions. Yeah. So, like, so I, I, um, oh, I've got another question here. How did you find traveling between campuses? Oh, that's um, a good question. What did yeah. I so, um, the first year is based at Royal Free Hospital. Uh, mainly there are some there's some lab teaching on Bloomsbury campus and perhaps your accommodation will be on Bloomsbury campus but really um, you see, London is really well connected uh, I wasn't living on either campus uh, and I got around to moving everywhere uh, but also students living I mean now I still do sometimes go from one campus to the other and there are buses connecting two campuses there's also the a northern line connecting two campuses so really um, in less than half an hour I would say more around 20 minutes really you're from one campus to the other um, and and it's fine to travel. I mean, it's um, it's quite normal in London. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> There's pros and cons, let's say. But uh, but yeah. Also, we we never timetable. Like you wouldn't have a lecture in Bloomsbury, then have your next lecture in Royal Free. We always think very carefully about timetabling. So if you're in one campus, you'll stay there, uh, and there'll, there'll be plenty of time if you need to move back and forth. Um. Okay, uh, just another question about the the courses, the modules in applied medical sciences, whether they are closely related to um, the modules with um, the course of innovative medicine and enterprise, and if they're in the same faculty. I've never heard of that course, interestingly. Innovative uh, medicine and enterprise. I might quickly Google it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've, I've literally never heard of that course. So you're talking about UCL, I guess. Uh, I guess so, because then the question says, says if they're in the same faculty, so I'm really guessing within the same university. Oh, medical innovation and enterprise. I guess. Uh, not, not innovative. So there's a, there is a course called medical innovation and enterprise. Mm -hmm. I think that is in the engineering faculty, or no, hang on. Med well, medical innovation and enterprise, isn't it the one in integrated medical sciences? 
Oh yeah, so that's one of our sister courses. But here, I don't know where the question says innovative medicine and enterprise. So perhaps they they meant this course. Yeah, perhaps they did. Yeah, so that's one of our mm -hmm. that's one of our faculty courses. Sorry, I'm confused by the, the way it was phrased. But yeah. Yeah, one of the sister courses. So in first year, they actually share all of the modules, almost all except one, perhaps. Um, and then you can go on to sue, uh, further specialize. Yeah. Yeah, it's in the division of surgery. So yeah, that's definitely in our faculty. Just mm -hmm. check. I didn't want to give you the wrong information, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'd say now time is up, unfortunately, and we'll have to uh, close it here. Um, and if you could please provide us with your feedback about today's session by filling out our survey, which you can find in the chat. And um, thank you really for all your comments and questions. Um, and thank you to Professor Ron for uh, this excellent session that you've held. And that's, that's it. Let's see, let me just check. Thank you. Thank you for, okay. Thank you for joining us, yes. And please find the link in the chat.